This video is brought to you by Squarespace. A senior officer said the video showed the awful callousness of the hooligans. Police had to intervene to control the fans. Disorders on the rise. A of bitter rivalry between their supporters, the West Makes it one of the world's most deadly football tragedies. This small faction of society has been seen as one of the most controversial subcultures in all of Europe. The football hooligan. Uh, it's not just the football, it's a whole subculture and a scene. And for the first time ever, I was, I was accepted. Exactly the same as us to go to the match with our boys. I mean, us and have a good scrap, you know what I mean? You don't hurt at the time because your adrenaline keeps you going. Well, before the football hooligan became its own subculture with its own fashion and attitude, violence in football has been there ever since the beginning. Around the 13th century, football started to become a sport. Two neighbouring rival towns would assemble what was pretty much an army of men in what was referred to as mob football. Between the years 1314 and 1666, over 30 football bands were put in place, with the main issue being the violence and the rioting that would come with it. But you see, gradually, football would begin to change. Around the late 1800s, football had kind of slipped into the hands of the gentleman. And with that was the introduction of modern football, with a rule set called the Cambridge Rules. It was now no longer a sport of the rioting common folk, and instead the sport of the ruling elite. But yet that didn't stop the violence. The first recorded instance of football hooliganism was in 1885, where Preston North End faced Aston Villa. The teams got upset and just started whacking each other with sticks and having a fight. A handful of instances like this would happen, but then England would go to war twice. Hostilities will end officially at one minute after midnight tonight. Post-war Britain was a very different place than before. In the 50s, we'd start to see a rise in these young youth subcultures, such as the Teddy Boys. By the 60s, you had the mods and rockers, as well as skinheads and hippies. Some of these different subcultures would be violent towards each other. They broke away from traditional British values and rebelled against British cultural norms. Well, I suppose I'll be married. I don't want to get married, but I suppose I will. At the same time, the UK was experiencing a massive wave of immigration post-World War II, with the change in demographics brought with it racial tension and violence. And so, in this time, the English identity was in flux. And as well in the 60s, mandatory military service for young men came to an end. And so, young working class men had very few places to let out their aggression. But then there was football. <laughs> Every single week, you and the boys could get together and go and watch your team play. This was an opportunity to get together with the boys and drink and occasionally get into a scrap with the opposing fans. And what started as just a bit of fun towards the late 60s and into the early 70s had really evolved into a class of people who were typically white working class men who would assemble these gangs associated with a football team. These gangs would become very organised and refer to themselves as firms. Arsenal had the herd, Millwall had the Millwall bushwhack. West Ham had the intercity firm. Each team would start to develop their own firm and they would become feared. A lot of people were wondering how this started. Some people believe it's in part due to the fact that the elder generation stopped going to football games. As they were becoming wealthier, there were other things for them to do and football stopped being this family affair that everyone would go and watch and really became a young man's pastime. And so with no elders to keep the young fans in check, they became more aggressive and more violent. Hooligans developed this deep pride in where they came from. A lot of it came down to respect. If they didn't feel respected, they would prove themselves by fighting the opponent. You know what I mean? If you ain't, if you ain't doing it on the terraces, you're going to be doing it somewhere else. It's just this is that, that violent streak. No, it's not a violent streak. It's being proud. Being proud of your man. Yeah, yeah, being proud of your man. I'm being fucking don't let people take the piss out of you. The attitude of most of these hooligans weren't really to go out and seriously hurt the opposition, but rather to just have some drinks, go watch football, and have a good scrap. All we're going for is right, a good game of football, a good clan chat, and a good piss up. That's all about Millwall. It was a break from their monotonous lives. Now, when they would come back to work on Monday, they'd all have stories to tell. Like how Barry took on five geezers with a pot in his hand without ever spilling a drop. Every week, they would go out fighting for their city, their town, their club. It gave them a purpose and an identity. When are you going to settle down and get married? Settle down and get married? Well, getting married, you're restricted, and you can't travel away with a team you love and love like, you know? And I was going to get married, but I knocked it on the head, all over Millwall. But very quickly, things started to get out of hand. 
Before we go further with this video, I want to give a shout out to Squarespace for sponsoring. Squarespace is the number one tool for building and developing your own website. Whatever it is you do, you might run a small business, you might be an art designer, whatever. It's so important to have a website that really reflects the quality of your brand. And luckily, Squarespace is here to do that for you. With tons of templates to choose from, you can easily customize any of them to perfectly fit your brand. And additionally, add in tons of features like email marketing, e-commerce, and appointment scheduling. I'm personally working on a website myself right now for a top secret project. And I've got to say, I actually enjoy the process of using Squarespace. It's not only cost effective and easy, but it's actually quite fun. So be sure to head over to squarespace.com forward slash Jimmy the Giant and to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain, use the code Jimmy the Giant. Anyway, back to the video. 150 were arrested well away from Stamford Bridge when they ran riot on the London Underground. Into the 70s and by 1974, Manchester United were relegated into the second division. Fans on the field again, spilling over from the corner on my right. And I suspect that uh, we shall see the referee calling the players off. Yes, he's taking them off. The Red Army firm caused carnage around loads of stadiums all up and down the country. That same year, a Bolton Wanderers fan stabbed a young Blackpool fan. Football hooliganism was getting out of control. Public sentiment was turning against football and starting to see it as a massive problem. So football organizers had to try and do something. They took measures to try and limit the crowd size. They segregated the home and the away fans with fences, but nothing was really changing. Up until then, football hooliganism was mainly just a problem in England. However, in the mid 50s, the European Cup was introduced and for the first time English football supporters had a chance to get the boys together, pack their lagers and head to war overseas. For Europe, the invading British mobs brought violence and destruction. For many of the hooligans, these were the most exciting times of their lives. It was kind of how I imagine the Vikings must have felt going out get into a country and just go an absolutely berserk. And with and this, they would spread what would become known as the English disease. Very quickly, issues started to spread abroad. In 1975, Leeds United were banned from playing football in Europe after their fans had an all-out riot after a game against Bayern Munich. Manchester United were banned after 1977 after fans were rioting before, during and after their cup-winning game against St Etienne. But you see, football hooliganism wasn't just being contained to the football grounds, but the hooligans would start to develop more organised criminal behaviours, such as looting high-end fashion brands. This, in and of itself would develop a unique fashion for football hooligans as Gary and the boys would come back to England dressed in the finest after the football games. This fashion would be dubbed football casuals. You used to see a lot of the, the majority of the fans wearing the shirts and then you get this small group of, of, of look like you know big big strong looking men. They used to be the ones that sung the most as well and used to yeah. start the songs off and back in the day the only time you saw Stone Island was at a football match pretty much, I'd say. To the point where if you saw a group of lads wearing Stone Island and CP company, or something along them lines, they were fair game. Whilst every other football fan would just wear the team's uniform, the football casuals become very distinct and able to detect. Wearing brands like Sergio Tacchini, Fila, Lacoste, Pringles, Stone Island, and many others. They'd often have the skinhead buzz cut. These lads would be dressed to the absolute nines every single football game and then get into massive fights. Was really not too spark out. Who's you playing football with? They're casuals. Casuals? It would be in the 70s and the 80s that would be considered the golden era of football hooliganism. The media coverage was in full swing. The UK was in a massive moral panic over football hooliganism. Things were starting to get more and more out of hand and they started to turn political. It was around the same time where large parts of the skinhead movement had been overtaken by far-right nationalist groups. Things like the National Front and the British Movement. These groups would lurch onto their more tribalist mentality and patriotic nature and a subsection of hooliganism become linked to far-right extremism. Where organisations like the National Front would deliberately try to recruit new members from football terraces. I do want to point out that Vice made a whole video on this and there's a lot of criticisms of that, saying that football firms tend to just represent the attitudes of the town they're from. So if a town is very right wing or very left wing, the hooligans will tend to represent that. And so football hooligans weren't inherently far right. That went through your window. Oh, that way hey, got through. I'll I'll do do that one. As I got to the gate, I got hit over the head with an iron bar. Either way, the British public was in full disarray. The middle classes of Britain had developed a very deep hatred for this sub culture there were often working class people who were seen as out wreaking havoc on towns on a weekly basis. It was a massive moral panic and due to the sharp rise in unemployment in the 80s there was a deep resentment in the working class and you could see that in things like the miners strike 
and the Tottenham riots, there were deep tensions in Britain and football became the main vessel to channel that anger. Things were getting pretty bad. Someone would need to come in and put an end to it. Bearing now Mrs. Thatcher as Prime Minister. 1985 was considered the worst year ever for football hooliganism. There were a few key instances that would really push the Thatcher government to act. On the 13th of March, Millwall and Luton would face each other. 31 people were injured when Millwall fans went on the rampage before, during and after the match. Described as one of the worst nights of violence in British football, the Prime Minister is demanding action. And it turned into a riot that destroyed Luton. 81 people were injured, 60 of those being police officers, 31 arrests were made. Fans tore up the stadium. They destroyed the town. They were smashing people's windows. One police officer suffered a heart attack. They had to receive mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation all whilst being kicked in the head by football fans. But it would be on the 29th of May where disaster would strike. The Heysel Stadium in Brussels, the capital of Belgium, has been a sickening and bewildering sight. As a result, there is for certain serious injury when a wall collapsed and maybe worse. Liverpool played Juventus in the European Cup final at the Heysel Stadium, where 39 people would be crushed to death by a wall that collapsed as a result of fighting. Italian. I would like to say to all the English people that they are very famous in the world for their education and self-control and so on. We have now the proof that all over in continent, Everybody say, don't be like English you know what I see After now. Brussels, the world shuts the door on English clubs. Today, the governing body, FIFA, registered their disgust over the events at Brussels by banning English clubs from all internationals. This ban lasted until 1990 and a year later for Liverpool to be unbanned. The UK had had enough. I wish we could get those responsible, get them before a court and stiff sentences so that they stop anyone else. It's Soccer violence has now reached the top of the political agenda. And so the Thatcher-led government set up a war cabinet to tackle football hooliganism. Along with the Popplewell Committee, many ideas were put forward and laws passed to try and tackle it. You had the Public Order Act in 1986, which permitted courts to ban fans from stadiums. The Football Spectators Act in 1989 banned convicted hooliganism from attending matches internationally. Stadiums were forced to make changes. They were no longer allowed standing sections. They had to have seats. Along with much tighter security, better quality turnstiles, and tickets were made much more expensive. Heisel and Hillsborough changed everything. Hillsborough more so than Heisel because it changed the design of stadiums. It's a kind of social cleansing of football, a deliberate pricing policy that has pushed hooliganism they thought to the back burner. But you see, the violence didn't stop immediately. The firms just got more organized and smarter and moved the violence out into the streets, where firms would become like militia groups, knowing how to ambush people with the locations they were in. These back streets, I knew uh, it was good for us because we knew where every back street, where they were going, away from us, didn't know where they were going, but we, we could. However, into the 90s, the English disease slowly started to cure. After the European ban was lifted, families actually started to attend football games again. Police presence had massively grown and they'd become much more equipped to deal with the problem. Hooligans were getting tougher and tougher sentences and violence did start to drop. There's over 4,000 Germans booked in for Europe this summer. You can come and take us out with your top firm, then you can take us on tour. As things started to really quiet down by the late 90s, by the early 2000s, a nostalgia grew for football hooliganism. There's nothing different about me. I'm just another bored male approaching 30 in a dead-end job who lives for the weekend. With films like The Football Factory, Green Street, The Firm, as well a very scared Danny Dyer did this show called The Real Football Factories. Mate, are you sure we're going to walk in this booze? We're going to end up getting ironed out by this little firm, you know what I mean? Yeah. But you seem sweet as, but it's early days yet, you know what I mean? I'm sure yeah. someone's going to glass me anyway. <laughs> Only joking. <laughs> Bless him. Books were being written and ex-football hooligans became famous. A romanticization of this era really grew in the mid 2000s. The football casual aesthetic had become a staple in fashion and can still be seen today. But football hooliganism never went away entirely. 
But in Russia, they're trained, organized, and brutally violent. England arguably exported hooliganism abroad, where instead of having firms, they call them ultras. And it appears that they are far more violent and intense than most British firms. We all went there to show that the English are not hooligans. They're just posers. They're little girls. Russia seems to have this hatred against England, and they want to prove that they're better than us, which led to the UEFA riots in 2016 between Russia and England. And football firms still exist, and there has been a bit of an effort to like organize these fights and make them a bit more legitimate, which personally I think is a pretty good idea. All of this has led many psychologists and sociologists to study and pin down what causes football hooliganism. And, and hooliganism emerged when there were, were, were lots of uncertainties about identity, uh, uncertainties about place, you know, even uncertainty about about gender identities, you know, with the emergence of hippie cultures and new ways of, of doing masculinity. Um, not really knowing where you belong and what have you, so I was attracted to the togetherness as well of, of all the lads, you know. It felt normal, plus you felt as if you had a family. For the first time, probably felt like I belonged somewhere. At the core of what drives these men are the same exact things that drive men to protect their countries in war. It's a powerful energy that comes with it a lot of responsibility. When carefully nurtured and directed into something positive, it can be amazing. But when it's not, it can be terrible. The violence of English football fans brought about the death of 38 people and injuries to 454. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel and watch this video right here.